This video introduces the concept of invariant sets. So far, the constraint code and development in this chapter has focused on the simple GPC algorithm. However, it was noted in chapter 4 that in general you might want to use a dual mode approach to model predictive control and that deploys infinite prediction horizons and particularly the thing you might notice the input prediction converges asymptotically rather than in a finite time. This video then is going to consider how we can do constraint handling when we've got predictions which involve over an infinite horizon because we still want or need a finite computational load. And in order to do this we're going to introduce the concept of invariant sets. First then a quick reminder of the dual mode algorithm. We tended to deploy a performance index a bit like this and the critical thing you'll see is we had an infinite horizon. We expressed the degrees of freedom as these perturbations to an underlying control law but we only allowed ourselves perturbations over a finite horizon and then resorted back to a simple control law over the infinite horizon. Now ideally if you were doing something like OMPC we'd want this perturbation term to be zero but we choose it to be non-zero when we need to in order to handle constraints. So what we're saying is the u equals minus kx is the controller we'd really like if we can use it. Now if you put this control law here, perhaps I should use a different colour, into this performance index along with the system dynamics, we found that the performance index reduced to something like this. Now what's important about this setup, what you'll find is if you calculate the predictions, then the state predictions have a form a bit like this, phi x, phi squared xk, phi to the nxk and so on, but critically you also have this extra term here, b times c future or phi b b times c future and so on. Now what's the other point that you might want to focus on? You'll see I've put dot 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 down here. These predictions keep evolving over an infinite horizon they don't suddenly stop. And you can make the same observation with the predictions for the future inputs. They keep evolving over an infinite horizon. They don't just stop over a finite horizon. Now why is that a problem? I need to compare them against constraints. So I may have simple constraints on the input, upper and lower limits, but critically you see here they have to be satisfied for all samples. I could have upper on lower limits on the rate constraints and again they have to be satisfied at every sample and I could have upper or lower limits on the outputs and other constraints but the most critical thing here is I need to satisfy these for k equals naught all the way up to infinity so I've essentially got an infinite number of constraints because my predictions are involving over an infinite horizon so what's our challenge? The predictions evolve over an infinite horizon and therefore comparing them against constraints may be a problem. We could have an infinite number of inequalities to deal with. So what we want to do is capture the constraint satisfaction over an infinite horizon but we want to do that using a finite number of inequalities. And the question is, is that possible? Fortunately it is possible under certain um, conditions and the mechanism for doing this was uh, given by a paper by Gilbert in 1988 and it's now um, well used across the whole community. So we'll demonstrate how this algorithm works with some simple algorithms so that you can understand the concepts. First let's set the scenario. Let the dynamics be given by something simple like this. So we've got a simple state evolution xk plus 1 equals a xk and the constraints may be on some variable y so we're going to define y as c xk. Let the constraints be simple upper and lower limits on y. So we've got a lower limit y under bar less than or equal to yk less than or equal to y over bar. <coughs> 
Now, if I want to test those constraints, I'm going to need to do it over an infinite horizon. So I've got things like CA x less than y over bar, CA squared x less than y over bar, CA cubed x less than y over bar. And this is going to go all the way up to, if you excuse the abuse of terminology, CA to the infinity xk less than or equal to over y over bar. And you're going to have a similar pattern for all the lower limits. The question you've got now is how far ahead are you going to go? Are you only going to go up to c a to the n and stop? But what about c a to the n plus 1? That might be where your constraint is violated. And that's the question we're going to ask next. So a key concept. If what we're going to do is say that if I ensure I satisfy my constraints for just the first n samples. You'll see that I'm just satisfying constraints for the first n samples into the future. And I assume that the lower limit is less than 0 and the upper limit is greater than 0. Then what I want to be able to say is, can I guarantee that therefore I satisfy constraints for all samples beyond n? So that's what I want to do. I want to just, in simple terms, I want to just check the constraints for the first 10 samples and then assume that the constraints must be satisfied for all the samples beyond then. Now, if I can do that, so there's a key word, if I can do that, then what we've essentially said is I can represent constraints over an infinite horizon just using predictions over a horizon of n. So that's what we want. We want to just test the constraints over a finite horizon and then be able to assume that they're satisfied beyond. And so can we do that? Well, if you assume that your transition matrix A has got strictly stable poles, which it must have for sensible predictions, then we can easily prove that a suitable n must exist. And the reason we can do that is we can say the limit as k goes to infinity of a to the power of k is 0. And therefore, the limit as k goes to infinity of yk is 0. Now, because I've put these two limits here, you can see that y under bar is strictly less than 0 and y over bar is strictly greater than 0. There will exist an n where this limit means that I can no longer violate a constraint. Now, I'm not going to go into the fine details. I'll leave that to the mathematicians for you. But hopefully, the concept is clear. So the question is then, how big a horizon do we need? So what we're going to do is assume the inequalities can be given for a specified horizon n. There they are. So you'll notice we've just gone up to c a to the n minus c a to the n. So that's how we're going to define our inequalities. And I'm going to write that using f and t. So in other words, I've got f x less than or equal to t. And now what I'm going to do is try and find a value x which will violate constraints at the next sample while ensuring that the constraints must be satisfied for the first n samples. So the key thing is I'm going to see if I can do that. I'm going to you know, go out of my way to say, does there exist an x which violates constraints at sample n plus 1? Now, the way I do that is some simple optimizations. You can see I maximize over x c a to the n plus 1 x k. So that's basically saying, I make this number as big as I can because I want it to be bigger. My target is y bar. Can I make it bigger than y bar? But I'm going to ensure that I satisfy constraints for the first n samples, which are these inequalities here. In a similar way, for the lower limit, I could do a minimize over x of c a to the n plus 1x, and now I'm comparing it to y under bar. And again, subject to constraints being satisfied before. So what's the key point? If I cannot, that's the key word, if I cannot force a violation, then n is large enough. It says as long as I satisfy constraints over the first n samples, I cannot violate thereafter. If I can force a violation, then this n is not big enough, so I need to make n bigger and try the same test. And that's basically the nub of the algorithm proposed by Gilbert.
So what's the key points? We assumed that the asymptotic value of the state was strictly inside the constraints and not on the boundary. And that's quite important because if you put it on the boundary, you won't necessarily converge. We use the origin for simplicity. That's what we're doing here. We're using the origin as the asymptotic point, And we assumed that the constraints were strictly negative and positive to ensure that 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 worked. So in other words, in essence, what we're doing is things like this. We're assuming that y under bar plus epsilon, where epsilon is some small positive number, is less than zero. <coughs> and similarly, y over bar minus epsilon is greater than zero. Now, where the origin is not the asymptotic point, you may need to use deviation variables to show an equivalent relationship and result exists. But generally, we might not be mathematicians. We might not be too bothered about the detailed proofs. So next, simplifying the set. So what we've done is we've said if we satisfy these inequalities, so that's testing the constraints over the first 10 samples, then we can be sure that we'll satisfy the constraints over an infinite horizon. However, there may still be a lot of unneeded inequalities in this set. Now, in general, what you should do is remove what we tend to call these redundant any inequalities that you don't actually need because what you'll find is if let's say you had a hundred inequalities maybe only 20 of those are actually important and you don't want to be carrying around that extra 80 all the time and if you go into thousands of constraints you might find 900 are redundant and you really do not want to be carrying those around however the point here is the MATLAB code produced for this video book is not going into that at this point because it's very simple code so you can look at it um, but you should note that in the longer term you do need to remove redundant constraints okay now what we want to do is introduce the concept of these words invariant and immiscible a set is called invariant because in essence what we're saying is for a given transition xk plus 1 equals axk and a different and a, and a given set f of xk less than or equal to t, if you put those two together, then the next state must lie in the same set. So that's the invariance. This bit up top is the admissible. It says not only am I inside the same set, but when I'm inside that set, I must be satisfying constraints. So invariance simply says that once you start in the set and you follow a given dynamic, you stay in the set. The admissible bit says not only do I stay in the set, but I also satisfy constraints. Now, people often use terminology maximal admissible set to say how's the biggest set I can get. So MAS stands for maximal admissible set. So if I use a set notation to say let's assume this is defined <coughs> as x which satisfies f x less than or equal to t, then what we're actually looking for is we're saying if x is in SMAS, then AX must also be in SMAS and we must also satisfy our constraints. And that's the sort of invariance conditions we're looking at. Strictly speaking, MAS means it's the biggest possible set I can find such that this is true. Whereas invariance simply says it's any set for which this is true. So maximum admissible set is uh, the terminology used when it's the largest that we can find. And membership of this set is both necessary and sufficient to satisfy constraints. So summary, what have we done? We've said let's express the predictions in the form xk plus 1 equals ax and express the constraints in the form gx less than or equal to f and after which we can find an MAS in the form given here. And what we've said we need to ensure that the initial set is closed and the reason for that is the code I'm providing is not robust to allowing some state directions to go off to infinity. And again, that's a mathematical detail I don't want to deal with in these videos, but you can do separately if you want to. So what we're going to do now is show some simple MATLAB code for determining these maximal admissible sets. The code that you need is in this file findmas.m and you can see it's got a very simple notation. You find the f matrix, the t vector, by substituting the transition matrix A and the constraint 
definition at each sample. But we emphasize here this file is not robust in that it assumes the initial set is bounded. So you, you cannot satisfy this with an unbounded value for xk. Now you can change that if you want, that's up to you. Um, if you haven't got boundedness, you could easily deal with this by adding some large upper and lower limits on the states just to ensure that. Now the examples I'm going to show are video 5a example 1 and video 5a example 2. So very quickly we'll just go to the MATLAB window and I got that wrong, didn't I? There it is. There's the MATLAB window. So there's video 5a example 1 and if I run that it generates some plots and I'm just demonstrating how easy these are to run and I'm going to go back and look at the results. And here's example 2 and you'll see it generates two plots for you. Um, so you can see again, as ever, the files are there. If you want to go and play around with them, if you want to change the state transition matrix, there's an A. If you want to change the inequalities at each sample, there they are. There's the find MAS. The files are there, so you can go and experiment with them should you want to. But what we're going to do is focus on the figures they produce. So example one, a simple one state transition matrix. There it is, xk plus 1 equals 0.8 xk. And there's the constraints to be applied at each sample. Now for this one, if you find the MAS, what you'll find is the MAS is actually the same as the initial constraints. So you only need n equals 1 for this case. And what I've done here is I've plotted the state evolutions and therefore it should be obvious that if you start for example at a limit you're always going to converge down to zero and therefore you only need to ensure the state satisfies the constraints at the first sample and it must satisfy them thereafter but that's a simple one state example and maybe that's obvious what about a two state example and here things are a little different you can see the constraints marked at each sample with these dotted lines and what I've done is I've chosen some initial conditions <coughs> which satisfy the constraints at the first sample. But then when you calculate the state evolution, what you find is xk plus 1 and xk plus 2 and so on do not satisfy the constraints. And in this particular case, you'll find that it's not enough just to test that I satisfy the constraints at that sample. And so what you'll find is that mo uh, maximal admissible set is actually much smaller than the original constraint. I must have an initial condition which is not on the boundary, but is somewhere inside the boundary to ensure that these predictions do not violate constraints. So if I do that, let's just um, get rid of these uh, lines so don't get in our way. If you actually calculate the MAS, and you'll see here, all these dotted lines show you all the inequalities that go with the MAS. And in this particular case, you'll see if I start inside all these inequalities, I stay inside. If I start inside all these inequalities, I stay inside. So as long as I start inside all these inequalities, then I stay inside. And so this region here is my MAS. Now, if you wanted to look where the original constraints were, you'll notice there was the original constraints. And what do you notice? The MAS is much smaller than the original constraints. So if I want to guarantee that I satisfy constraints for all future samples, then my initial condition has to be inside a much smaller set. And in this particular case, you'll see we've put it here, the MAS has 32 inequalities. So a summary. This video has shown how constraint satisfaction for predictions can be tested over an infinite horizon using a finite number of inequalities. However, we did make some assumptions. We assume that the prediction dynamic is strictly convergent, and it's also necessary that the asymptotic values are strictly inside the sample constraints. That is, they're not on a boundary. The invariant set defined by these inequalities is sometimes called the maximal admissible set. And what we're going to do in the next video is show how we can now use these results with our OMPC and SOMPC algorithms.